I think sometimes when we look at Jesus and the story of Jesus, we have a hard time understanding why everybody just didn't believe in him, you know? I mean, here he comes, he does all these miracles, he does all these great things. And you think, well, people would just believe, right? I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I think if I saw somebody heal a blind man, cause a cripple to walk, raise somebody from the dead, I think it would get my attention. I, I don't know about you, but I think I might stand up and kind of pay attention a little bit if somebody did that. And you would think, why didn't they? You know, why didn't they just say, well, surely this has got to be the guy. I mean, he does the miracles. He's got the power. Surely it's got to be him. And I think that's something I kind of wonder about sometimes. Why didn't they? Why don't we believe something? You know, even sometimes if something's right in front of our face, like black and white, sometimes if we really think that that's not true, we won't believe it, right? Even though it's right in front of us, we don't believe it. Why do we do that? Why do we have a hard time sometimes accepting the truth or changing our mind about something? Why do we hang on to, to something that sometimes we know is not even right? You know, maybe there's a lot of reasons for that. But I think in Jesus' case, it really had to do a lot with how he came into the world, right? He came in meek and lowly, didn't cause any fuss, wasn't born into the elite of the day, the powerful of the day. He uh, was raised in a nondescript town by nondescript parents. Had no title to anything that was of fame or notoriety. People were expecting the Messiah to come with a bang, weren't they? Big deal, fanfare. And all of a sudden, that's not what happened, right? Jesus comes in, as we would say, lowly, riding on a donkey, right? But even the people in Jesus' family really didn't believe that he was the Christ. And it's something I kind of wonder about. You know, the angel appeared to Mary and said, you're going to have this child, he's going to be the Son of God. So, you know, you've got to think Mary and Joseph knew right? I mean, you would have to think they knew. I mean, it wasn't like an if. They knew. The angel appeared to Joseph. The angel appeared to Mary. But then he's got these other, these other siblings. When Jesus was 12, he got lost in the temple. We know that story. Not lost, but they left him in Jerusalem at the temple. And they went back and they found him. And he was teaching everybody and it says, when he went down with them and came to Nazareth, he continued in subjection. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. It's one of the real few glimpses we get of the childhood of Jesus. We really don't get any other glimpse. This is it. This is the one. This is the only one. And, you know, she treasured these things in her heart. But it appears that his siblings, his brothers and his sisters, weren't that impressed. Right? Right? I mean, they really didn't think that this little guy from this little town was significant. I mean, it's just this little bitty place, this little bitty poor village of Nazareth that, that is uh, nothing special about it, right? Nothing special about it. Little bitty town, out of the way. Why would, why would the Messiah come from here? Of all places. I mean, if God's going to send the Son, the Son of God's going to come to earth, man, he should be in Jerusalem, right? Shouldn't he? He should be in Jerusalem. He should be in the center of Judaism. He should be, you know, uh, right there where it's all happening. But yet here he is, off in this little village, growing up with these brothers and sisters, this mother and father, the son of a carpenter. Nothing real exciting here. This is not an exciting place, not an exciting idea. So Jesus goes back. He was baptized by John. He's tempted the wilderness. He's starting his ministry. And this is early on. This is early in his ministry, Luke 4. And Jesus goes back home. And you think, well, how would that work out for him, right? Not too good, right? So Jesus goes back home. And he told them, he said, the day of jubilation is here. You know, it's being fulfilled in your hearing. 
Um, this is the time. I'm the guy. Um, they were filled with rage. And they drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had built in order to throw him down the cliff. You know, they did not just not believe him. They didn't believe him to the point that they thought he was a blaspheme against God. They were going to kill him. This is a big thing. The people who, who he grew up with, the people who knew him from the time he was a child, they wanted to kill him because they didn't believe that this Jesus, this Jesus that grew up on the streets of this city could be the Son of God, could be the Messiah. It's very difficult, in a way, to understand. In John chapter 7, it says, Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples may also see the works which you're doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourselves to the world. Listen to what they say. Right there. Listen to what they say in 4. If you do these things... You see that? If you do these things, they're not convinced, are they? They're not convinced. Maybe they haven't personally observed Jesus perform a miracle. Maybe all they, it's what they hear. And so they're challenging him. They're saying, if you're the guy, if you do these things, then just do it in public. Do it where we can see you. Because John says... For not even his brothers were believing in him. That's kind of powerful, isn't it? Not even those closest, the ones he grew up with, the ones that he went to school with or whatever they did, the ones that he played with in the streets, the ones that lived in his own household, didn't believe it was him. It's really an interesting idea, isn't it? Because I hear all these things, and I hear these songs people sing about this little child son of God that does no wrong and said, oh, my father made all this. I don't get that from the Bible. I don't see that here. His brothers were thinking, he's just our brother, right? In Matthew 11, it says, he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will, be exalted, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which incurred of you, occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. That's about the most harsh rebuke Jesus could give a town. Sodom was destroyed. Destroyed, right? Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by God because of their sin. And Jesus said, if the miracles had been performed in Sodom, which had been performed in you, it, that city would still be here because they would have repented. And yet you didn't repent at the miracles. I think it's really interesting because people say, oh, if I just saw a sign, right? If you just show me a sign, I'll believe in Jesus. Just show me a miracle. Show me the Holy Spirit. Show me a sign and I'll believe doesn't work that way people don't work that way we never have because you know the bigger the sign jesus did the more they wanted another one did you ever notice that jesus did all these miracles and all these signs and all this stuff and the scribes of pharisees come and they said show us the sign that we might believe and i'm like good grief right how many do you need and yet they were unconvinced the miracles didn't convince them that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. Didn't do it. It's really a really weird deal, isn't it? You think, boy, if I saw that, I'd believe it. They didn't want to believe it. This little Jesus from this little town, he can't be the Messiah. There's got to be a mistake, right? He's doing this by the power of Satan. He can't be doing this by the power of God. He's a trickster. He's a charlatan, right? He's a sorcerer. There's no way he's the Christ can't be hmm seems kind of interesting doesn't it in matthew jesus goes back didn't work out too good the first time right tried to kill him throw him off a hill in matthew 13 jesus goes back 
Jesus finished his prayer, but he departed there, came to his hometown, began teaching them in their synagogue. They were astonished. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown or in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. I think that's one of the really interesting. It's, that's a passage that's always meant a lot to me, that particular passage. Because when I started preaching, and they said they wanted me to preach, and I said, you know, a prophet's not without honor save in his hometown. I mean, I live here. People know me here. People know how much of a mess up that I really am in real life. And you want me to preach. It'd be easier to go someplace nobody knows you. Then you could put on an air that you were a lot better person than what you were. But when you live here and people know you, it's like, huh. And Jesus said, when he went back to Nazareth and it was his hometown, he said there was no honor there for him. Because they could not believe that this Jesus, this Jesus who grew up there, this son of Mary and Joseph, they could not believe that he was really the son of God. Couldn't do it. Didn't want to do it. Couldn't accept it. That that's how it was. In John 6, Jesus answered and said, Truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. It's, I've had a struggle with this. I'm like, what does he mean by that? You know, that was a sign to eat the loaves and were filled, right? He says, you didn't follow me because you saw the signs. You didn't follow me because I'm the son of God, because I can do these miracles. You followed me for what you could get out of me. That's what you did. He says, do not work for the food which perish, for the food which endures which eternal life. For the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Once again, we see this idea that the miracles didn't produce the faith, the salvation that Jesus wanted them to have. It just didn't happen. John 6, if you go through this passage, John 6 goes on and he says, you know, that if you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you'll have a part of me. And as we get down to the end of that in John 6, John 6, 66, the result of this, many disciples withdrew and we're not walking with him anymore. Even those ones that were following him, even those ones that seemed to believe that the end, they withdrew from him. They weren't following him anymore. They couldn't follow what he was saying. They could, it was difficult then for them to understand who he was, what he was, what he was about. He was not the Messiah that they wanted. Isn't that terrible? He was not the Messiah they wanted. He was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. But he was not the Messiah that the Jews wanted. They wanted that guy that was going to be a king. They wanted that guy that was going to lead him in a battle. They wanted that guy that was going to start that earthly kingdom. And Jesus wasn't that guy. Didn't change who he was. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. But he wasn't the one they wanted. And because of that, they would not accept him. And Jesus looks at those closest to him, at Peter, and he says to the twelve, and he says, you do not want to go away also, do you? And Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? I think this is the crux of this whole lesson right here. He said, to whom shall you go? You have the words of eternal life. He didn't say, where shall we go? You've done all these miracles, you've got to be him, right? You've done all these signs, you've got to be the guy. Because all them signs, all them miracles apparently didn't produce the faith that Jesus was looking for. And when he talked to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter answered him, and he doesn't say, well, Lord, we believe you because you raised the dead. We believe you because you made a blind man see. We believe you because you made a cripple walk. We believe you because you cast out a demon. We believe you because you cleansed the leper. Peter says, we believe you because you have the words of eternal life. And I think that really drives home what Jesus was about. John says, Jesus was the way and the truth 
and the life. He was the truth. The truth was in his words, in his speech, in what he had to say. And although his brothers before the resurrection didn't believe him, didn't believe in him, it was in very brothers after the resurrection, Paul tells in 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to James. It's those brothers, James and Jude, who wrote those two books of the Bible, who were leaders in the Jerusalem church. They weren't convinced by the miracles. They weren't convinced because to them, Jesus was their little snotty-nosed, or I guess he would be the older brother, right? He was that belligerent older brother that nobody likes because nobody likes the oldest, right? He was that older brother that nobody liked. And all the miracles on earth didn't convince them that he was the Christ, except one, right? When Jesus appeared to them after he was raised from the dead, they believed. Peter says, you had the words of life, the words of eternal life. And one of the greatest testimonies to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is the fact that according to the Bible, his brothers didn't believe in him, didn't believe who he was, didn't believe he could be the Christ, didn't believe he could be the Son of God. And after the resurrection, those brothers are the very pillars of the church in Jerusalem. Converted because they saw a resurrected Christ. Their brother, right? Their brother. Resurrected to be their Lord. It's just a fascinating idea to me. Fascinating study of Jesus. Why didn't they believe? Why didn't they think it was him? Well, many of them never did, right? But many of them, when they saw him raised from the dead, knew that he was the Christ, the Son of God. And that's what our faith, that's what our hope is built on, is that this Jesus Christ, this little Jesus from Nazareth, was the Messiah who would change the world. Thanks for your time. If we can help you in any way, won't you let it be known while we stand?